pertinent. What keeps you from doing things? Fear. Okay, so I'm going to write this big letters down here in red. Ish color. <laughs> Whatever color that is, fuchsia. Okay. Okay, so this is something that's really important. Everybody who, if I try to train someone in here to do something stupid, I actually have my kettlebell, and we're going to do that in my physio class today. I didn't bring my kettlebell down here because um, it's heavy. <laughs> but it's in my office. But if I, tr if I could, could I get any of you to, to use the kettlebell? Yes. What prevents you from trying? Fear. What's the fear if I give you a heavy thing to pick up? What's your fear? I won't be able to lift it. I'll look stupid. What else is your fear? People, oh, I always work out barefoot. People say, well, aren't, won't you worried about dropping the weight on your foot? <laughs> Will this protect my toes? No. The only thing that shoes protect your toes from, really, is when you step on crap. But if you have a nice swept gym floor, and Ivan the rat, he's fine. He lives at our gym. He's cute. I think he's got a new friend, though, because we saw another one. Yeah. Well, sketchy. That's perfect. Okay. I like sketchy gym. Um, but what prevents you from doing anything is fear. If I pick on the folks with the English as a second language who aren't the strongest English speakers, <laughs> what prevents you from answering questions in class? Fear. You're afraid of saying the wrong thing. I felt so bad for Kylie and Stats yesterday. She kept giving the wrong answers. But there's a nice thing about being an extrovert. I'm an extrovert. Marvel is an ext extrovert. Well, we're not as affected by social fear as introverts. Introverts are like, social fear! <laughs> extroverts are like, social fear! <laughs> and so that's why I, I am generally not afraid of things. My, my adage, because, I, because of my extrovert personality, is challenge accepted. She, she even tried casting the fishing pole. She's like, how do I do this? Whoosh! <laughs> it's like right off the bat, full gusto. That's what extroverts do because we, we tend to push our agenda on everybody else. For the introverts, it's extremely irritating. Sorry. I'm bad for being an extrovert. Okay, moving on. So what we want to do is we're going to explore this idea of fear, because now we're going to explore this idea of how we use the first half of this class in the application side. But from now until the end of the semester, we're using the application of the stuff we learn in the first part of class. So what is, what is this thing called the mind? I'm going to show you. Okay. Okay. So, I could be smart ass. There's one. Okay. And I broke it. I'm sorry. There you go. See, that's my extrovert self being obnoxious. My wife goes, why do you always have to take it too far? Sorry. That's what I do. Okay, moving on. So, okay, so what's the mind? What, what did we talk about the first unit? With the whole idea of the, the first chapter? Okay, so behavior is, that's chapter, that's just the third unit that we did of the thing about learning. Why is it still, oh, there it goes. So behavior, that's learning. So why do we have to study behavior in psychology before we do anything else? The only thing that you can measure as the introvert. Okay. Okay. So, so the idea of measuring behavior is the purpose of studying psychology as a science. But what is the mind? not behavior. I didn't even get a sip. Perspective. 
Your mind is a perspective. Do you learn from other people's minds? Yes. Okay. But did anybody ever see the engineering professor laying on a rock? Yeah, Duncan, he's retiring, but every, there's a big rock over by the library, and periodically he'll kind of stumble out of his office and lay on the rock to recharge. I've got pictures of him laying on the rock. Anyway, because um, it's funny. So, okay. so your, your, your mind is perspective. We look at things and assume cause and effect. We assume cause and effect. So when the door just closes randomly, it's a ghost. Do people do that? Yeah. My, um, my poor little daughter, when she was four or maybe five, my, my parents were in town watching my, the kids. And my friend and my wife, myself, and a friend went to... Um, one of their couple actually went to Las Vegas. So my, my parents and my mother in law and my father in law are watching the big, the kids. Four adults, two kids, they got this covered, right? My mother in law decides to take the my my folks on a tour of Old Town in the evening. And they mother in law is a she's a big historian and so she loves the history of Old Town and she's she taught classes there with the history of Old Town. So right at 7 o'clock, they go have dinner, and then she goes off the, the 9 o'clock tour with my 4-year-old little daughter of the Whaley House. Okay, so people who are not hip to the San Diego scene, what's the Whaley House? Haunted House. And what they do is they really shaggy dog up the haunted house. They tell you stories as you're walking through the house. And as, so if I'm priming you... If I'm priming you for being afraid of something, and then anything weird happens, like the door closes, what happens? Your, your brain automatically puts the cause and effect relationship, it's a ghost! Right? So anybody know why the door closed in reality? Somebody opened the door out there, because you heard the clunk out there right, as, right after that door closed. So when, when you pull that door open, it causes the air pressure to change. So I can science out, but why is it easier to say ghost? Because if I prime you about thinking about ghosts and then something weird happens, has anybody ever lived in an old house? Like our house is 95 years old. Does it make noises all the freaking time? Yeah, it just goes creak and crack. And every so often, one of the window sashes will break, and you hear this thunk in the middle of the night, and you walk around, there's nothing there. And my favorite is the random whistle from the pipe. We have one right now, and I cannot figure out where it's coming from. Usually a piece of gaffer tape wrapped around the pipe, at that point where it's whistling is fine, and it, it, you won't do it anymore. But So somebody turns on the hot water, or the sprinklers come on, and you hear this and it's barely audible and you're like looking around for a freaking cricket somewhere you're trying to find it the water shuts off and the sound goes away like, oh. basically two pipes are sitting next to each other and when the water is running through at the right frequency they vibrate which causes the whole house to resonate got some tape on it good to go it also means that there's a hole wearing through the pipe right there and it's going to burst eventually but you can wait for that okay moving on 90-year-old house. So, why do we look for cause and effect? Why do we look for ghosts? It's what we do. Um, I listened to this on driving up uh, to the mountains on Wednesday. Um, we drove up in that night. We left here right after school around 3 o'clock, and we got up there around 11 o'clock at night. Um, and so I was listening to podcasts all the way up because my family was bored and sleeping, and I'm, like, trying to stay awake not kill everybody. So one of the podcasts I was listening to is these two ladies that do a thing called Wine and Crime. Anybody heard of this? If you like crime stories, these two ladies basically sit and drink cheap wine and do research on 
specific crimes. Like the, the one episode I was listening to was about a kidnapping, where the kid disappeared right after school, and then they tell the whole backstory, and then they tell the whole full, full story. So you actually get the full sequence of the crime. And sometimes they're grisly murders, sometimes they're whatever, but they're just, it's cool. But, and then the second part of the podcast was about paranormal stuff. Yeah, I moved into this house and I kept seeing the shape of a man walking across and I looked and he's not there. And I found out the person who lived there died there and he used to be a thin man. So as I'm listening to this, I'm like going, I'm not a paranormal person, sorry. But do you have parts of your brain that measure movement? Yeah, it's called the middle temporal cortex. The middle temporal cortex registers movement. And here, brace yourself. If you use hallucinogenic substances, guess what you can start to see? Things moving. Like you're standing here like this, and all of a sudden there's a shape moving over here. You look at it, it's not there. Then it's over here. You look at it, it's not there. And you look around for it, and then it's over here again. It's exactly the same place every time in your perceptive field because it's activating the movement centers right here. Does it have shape or form? No, it's just the movement centers. But if I activate the movement centers with the shape recognition centers, like one of the things she said, it was a man's body. I can't describe it, but I know it's a man's body. So the movement center that identifies the shape of man was activated with the movement center. So she saw a man's body. He wasn't walking. He was just like floating there because the activate. So I can cause and effect it by looking at analyzing the brain. You can actually analyze almost all this paranormal stuff out pretty good. But why do people want to find the paranormal stuff? Like Bigfoot. It wasn't me, but still. Why do people want to find that stuff? Sasquatch. Finding the very rare, very subtle cause and effect relationships in humans is extremely rewarding. For example, anybody in here colored by numbers? You have this giant page and you have like, you're looking for all the fours. And you find the last little tiny four, you're coded, and you're like, oh. connect the dots, it's doing math problems. Some people find it extremely entertaining because you're looking for that cause and effect relationship. What happens when you don't find the cause and effect relationship? It's extremely frustrating. It causes anxiety. Wait a second. So if you can't find cause and effect, it causes fear. Why is it scary to be around people with schizophrenia? The crazy person that's yelling at you outside your house. You don't know what they're going to do. There's a, there's a lot of homeless folks in our neighborhood. Um, one of them was outside of the gym putting his bicycle back together because he had taken it apart at some point. Um, but he was obviously under the influence of meth by looking at his eyeballs. And then about three minutes after he got his bike back together, he crashed and fell asleep across the doorway of our gym. Why not just poke him with a stick and say, hey, can you please move so we can go work out? I don't know how he's going to react. Because I can't predict how he's going to react, I, it causes anxiety. It causes fear. And especially there's, there was a gentleman that was standing at the 7-Eleven, and we, you walk by him and his eyes just stare right through you like you're, you didn't walk by. Our 7-Eleven's a little bit on the rough, rough side. <laughs> I've only had two shootings there, but that's okay. Um, Greg, I can't. <laughs> but, yeah, go at three in the morning, like on, your, on a beginning of a road trip sometime. But there's a guy that live right behind the house that always sit out in front of the porch, and the cars keep driving by, and guys keep coming by with backpacks. Yeah, that's, the, that's where the distribution point is for the neighborhood. So if you need... Anyway. So whenever my son has to go, wants to go to 7-Eleven, I'm like, don't buy drugs, kids. <laughs> Well, then the car's not there, Dad. Okay, so. Okay, so. Uh, old men, backpacks, BMX bikes. Our neighborhood. That's just it. Okay. 
<laughs> you guys live near, near us. So do you live in North Park, right? Or City Heights, yeah. So you have the same, same vibe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> same vibe. So, the way we, way we roll in the hood. Okay. <laughs> I can say that because I got the van. Okay. So, again, getting back to this, getting back to this idea of finding cause and effect. In psychology, in the application of it, we call it attribution. It's called attribution theory. Attribution theory. So what does the word attribution mean? Okay, so one of the things is, is the details. What else? So when you say describe somebody's attributes, characteristics, I'm going to write this up with other word up here. Traits. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit, in about a week or so, but it's called, it's called trait psychology. I mean, I've already talked about traits. We talk about introvert versus extrovert. Those are just characteristics. Those are attributes of a person. You can, you can look at them and see the person's traits. Are traits relatively consistent across people? Introvert. Okay, how come I can point to some people and say introvert versus extrovert? Well, we stuck his brain on the brain scanner, but based on the, base, based on the way that you behave in class, I can label you introvert versus extrovert. I, it's, I have a wonderful TA named Africa, and Africa was so smart, but she does not like to talk in public. Super, super smart. But so I gave her a couple really hard things to do in my office on the computer, and I had to go teach a class. I go, here, figure this out. She's like, okay. All, all year, she spoke probably 10 words. Just because she doesn't, she just doesn't feel comfortable. When she's with her friends, she's a lot more bubbly and outgoing. But when she's in this setting, she's not comfortable. So she just, but that's just part of her personality traits. And she, she works at Sprout, so say, oh, we talked about you in class, Africa, and she'll just wither up and die. It'll be great. So she stand, she's a, about this tall, Latina, and just it says Africa on her shirt. <laughs> her sister's name, America. Yeah. I asked her, is your sister great yet? <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> and she gives me that, the, the emoticon of that. <laughs> It's my personal favorite emoticon. Anyway, so, so when we talk about attribution theory, when you see somebody behave, you see somebody's behavior, how do you attribute their behavior? Okay, so let's go, let's go through this. There's two ways you can attribute somebody. So let's say yesterday, um, oh, not yesterday, Sunday morning, we got up at like 3 in the morning up in the mountains and drove back so we'd still have Sunday here, okay? And so as we're driving back, you see there's some random people that drive slightly uniquely on the freeway. I had to go last night. I had to drive to Kearney Mesa to sign something last night. We bought a car for my daughter yesterday, so I had to, they forgot part of the signing paperwork, so I had to go sign it last night. What the hell are you guys doing who drive after 8 o'clock at night? I don't generally drive that much that late. Somebody merging onto the freeway going 45. Getting over three lanes by the time he's up to 50. What are you doing? And then my favorite is the weedy guy who obviously had a few drinks on the way home from work. He's trying to make it home. And it's like, so why? So when someone is a bad driver... Let's say this. The person is just recklessly speeding. We saw lots of that driving home. I had the cruise control set. We made it. It's 450-something miles. We made it in 6 hours and 15 minutes. Cruise control set at 85, um, just pretty much the whole way in the minivan. 28 miles per gallon. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Now, 
Um, we had to slow down twice because of traffic. That's it, though. So we had great drive. People left were going past me like I was standing still. Why? Okay. So there's two reasons. So I went, they're dispositional. In other words, they're stupid. So when I say something, somebody's disposition, I'm saying about them. They're stupid. They're a jerk. Someone's tailgating you. You go to pull over and they flip you off when they go by. I rue the day when my daughter gets to drive, a couple, like April 22nd, because she is one of those people that waits. She keeps accelerating until she has to brake. Trying to keep her from doing this because she, like, she jams on the brakes all the time. The brakes are going to wear out. Okay? But why is that a problem? Well, she'll be flipped off multiple times. That's okay. I don't care about that. I have a van. People flip me off all the time because I drive like I don't care. Because I don't care. Um, but if someone's tailgating you and you jam on the brake, it's much more likely to run into them. So that's one of the things you notice when you're driving a long time on the freeway. I always leave two car lengths between myself and the car in front unless we're going less than 15 miles an hour. Just, I always do. People cut in front of me all the time, so I just, fine, go ahead. My favorite is the cut in front of me and then pull out into 80 mile an hour traffic from 15. You watch all the cars, and the person's like, ah! Oh. Okay, that's the 215-60 merge. Insane. Okay, but... But if you don't leave, so, okay, let's go back. If, they're, if you say, well, they're stupid because you're making a dispositional comp uh, uh, attribution, you're assuming that the traits, the characteristics of the person are because of their personality, because of who they are. Is there another way to explain it? They're in a hurry. Um, Nancy Jennings, wonderful, my friend Brian, who passed away, getting run over by a car. Um, well, their second son was gestating at eight and three quarters months pregnant. Uh, Brian's finishing painting a wall. And Nancy's sitting on the couch watching Brian finish paint the wall. And all of a sudden she goes, ooh, contraction. Brian says, can I just finish this so we have an even coat of paint? She's like, sure. Last labor took a long time. What happens with your second baby? Much faster. <laughs> so all of a sudden, she's like, uh-oh, they're getting closer. So Brian put down the roller and jumped in. I, I swear it was, a, it was probably the Honda Civic, but in my brain, they had this red Suzuki Samurai back then. My brain is a Suzuki Samurai. Anybody know what those look like? The little tiny Jeep that they actually killed one of the test drivers when they were test, the, the EPA was testing it. When they jammed on the brakes, it, <laughs> it tipped over forward. Like did an endo. Eh. Okay. <laughs> it didn't get very high safety ratings at all. Just say. Anyway. So, so Brian and Nancy jump in the car, and they live in Crest, and they have to get to, all, to um, Zion Hospital, Kaiser, at 9 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> so, basically, Brian is full tilt boogie. In my head, it's in the Suzuki, but it's probably in, this, in, this, in the Honda Civic on the shoulder, going up on the ice plant, zigzagging through, honking the horn. People try to pull over to cut him off because what do they assume? He's just being a jerk and doesn't want to wait in traffic. But is there a reason why he's driving like an asshole? Yes, he does not want to have a car baby. Well, that's, and my friend Shannon had the same thing. Actually, her son... It, I was almost in college, so he, I could, one of these days he might be in my class. It'd be great. But when, when Ashlyn, Shannon's daughter, was being born, she had a C-section first. And it's very dangerous to have an vaginal birth after a C-section because the sutures for where you sewed your uterus together can rupture and you can... <laughs> not good. So she's driving... They're, she's, you know, getting, they have a scheduled C-section for that afternoon, and they're taking the time. All of a sudden, she starts going into labor. 
They live in East Lake, and they have to get the children to the hospital, or rainy hospital. Yeah, and so it's, again, same time in the morning, not good. So Scott, and this, this is in the Ford Explorer, I knew that one, is just hammering up the shoulder. Police pulls behind him. What do you do? No, no, because then they spike strip you. <laughs> you. Okay, no, you call 911 and say, hey, I'm the high-speed pursuit on the 805. Unless you want to deliver a baby on the side of the road, can you please get in front of me? And as soon as she called the dispatch, or well, he called the dispatch because she was going, um, <laughs> but the, disp- the, the cop that was behind him turned on the sirens, and then a motorcycle cop showed up out of nowhere and got in front of them, and they were escorted them to the hospital where she was, she actually did have a vaginal birth after, but was in the hospital, which is much safer. Scary, but safer. Um, but it, and it's funny because when you, why do you automatically judge dispositions? This is easy. Okay? It's easy. It's automatically to look, to look for cause and effect in other people's minds. Why is it hard to know the situation? It takes too much time to analyze the situation. So we naturally put attributions onto other people's minds. It takes too much time to make situational attributions. It takes too much time. And I promised myself I'd start going down, not just keep going across. <laughs> I'm sorry, because I, I, I still got to remember to do that. Okay. So now, Do we make good attributions or do we make bad attributions? What do you think? Well, when, when are you good at it? So when would you be good at it? So I'll give you an example of a gentleman named John Keith. Do I not use his name? Um, <laughs> He sold, he's trying to sell us a Lexus's. Lexus's. Well, a couple years ago, my wife wanted a nicer car when she became a principal. She, we have a little bit more money. She's like, I want a nicer car. She drove the Ultima before that. No one ever says, nice Ultima. And it was a great car, but it's, quote, car, unquote. So we went and test drove Accords, um, Lexus's, and used BMWs. Um, and right, anything right around $35,000 price range, thirty dollars to $35,000 price range for the car. Um, and it's annoying that a 3 Series costs the same as a Honda Accord. Anyway, um, we got the 3 Series, and we had to sell it because she hated it. Oh, sorry. It was so awesome. Sorry. Now, so we're driving the Lexus, and El Cajon Lexus, we pull around, you know, you, you, and you know where that is? El Cajon Lexus, it's on, I think, Marshall. But right on, or Johnson, I think the street is. But there's a street right there where the trolley goes across Fletcher Parkway. And it's insane. There's like 50 different lights going 10 different directions. And my wife pulls to this light and the trolley lights start blinking. And like every light's a different color. And she's, she's going, what do I do? And he goes, oh, just, just wait. He goes, I had an Asian woman that had trouble with this just the other day. And I'm sitting in the back seat with my son. And I'm like, let it go or comment? If I let it go, what is my son going to attribute the trouble to? Asian. Because he made a dispositional attribution. Why couldn't she handle the traffic light? Not the situational attribution, but he said, oh, I had an Asian woman that had a really hard time with this. Why mention the fact that she was Asian? Yeah, so people automatically assume because she's Asian, she can't drive. The guy that was trying to sell us the car. 
John Peace. Not going to mention his name, so I don't want to embarrass him. Now, actually, it's funny. You guys, okay. So now, so John, basically, I go, why is it important that you tell us she's Asian? He goes, oh, no, 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 I'm not racist, but she was fresh off the boat. It, it does get worse, doesn't it? <laughs> because what he's doing, what he's doing is he has a disposition. He has characterized, using a stereotype, which we'll go into a little bit, but he's characterized her entire population as a, dis as a, a disposition. And people try to justify their disposition. Well, if she was freshly immigrated, probably came on a plane, not off a boat, but um, just saying, uh, but why would they say fresh off the boat? What is that a metaphor for? Does anybody know? Not, not normal immigrants. From the, they used their, there's a bunch of people from Cambodia that were boat people that came, in, that came in after Vietnam on these big boats because they were too poor to... And back in, back in the 1800s, a lot of the Chinese laborers that used to, they used to build the railroads came in off of boats. And when people got, were fresh off the boat, literally you take this poor Chinese worker that has never seen anything other than his village and you dump them in downtown San Francisco. And so the poor folks are running around. I mean, just imagine if we dumped you downtown China. How well you'd do. Maybe one or two people in here would survive. That one kid that went to Lakeside that speaks Mandarin. Yes! <laughs> My friend's son went to that Lakeside Academy. He speaks Mandarin. Yeah, it was really cool. He, we were out at a noodle place, and he ordered for us. I'm like, nice, dude. He doesn't remember names of streets or names of cars and anything else, but he does speak Mandarin, so that's important. Okay. What was that car we saw the other day? The Ferrari? Yeah. It was red. My son's like, it was a 458 California edition. Anyway, he can't speak Mandarin. Though. Okay, moving on. So... So what, again, looking at this, looking at this problem of attribution is that we tend to make what's called the fundamental fundamental attribution error. We assume it's a dispositional. We assume that it's dispositional. We assume that this person can't drive because those people can't drive. Has anybody here ever been to Italy? Oh, that's right. Okay, what are the drivers like in Italy? Yeah, it's like the same thing as if you ever go to India. My friend Patrick went to India. He, was a, he works for... Um, the child child welfare organization world I forget what it's called world child health something something he works for NATO and so he goes around and does children issues all over the world and he refuses to drive he's German he refuses to drive everywhere because he said they don't follow rules and they don't make eggs without chilies in them either which is impossible for him to eat anything with spices in it so he's like anyway so. He goes, in Germany, do drivers follow the rules? Really, really well. There's very few traffic accidents. Because we follow the rules. <laughs> what are the rules in Italy? Yeah. <laughs> Get where you're going is the rule. <laughs> and people go on the wrong side of the street, and everybody's got little cars, and there's, there's really no defined lane, so they kind of screw in between each other, and you're just scratching and crunching, and... Every single car has got skid marks on its fenders. Yeah, and yeah, Boston is the same way. Your car is not yours until you've dented one of the fenders in traffic in Boston. It's the way it is, yeah. Okay, so this is, where, this is actually where we're going in this class. This is the application. So I want to give you this vocabulary. Then we're going to start looking at why. So you're, you're exactly thinking the right thing. Because you assume dispositions. Well, let me, get, let me finish the other part, and then we'll say what you just said. Okay? The second part of this is really simple. Ah, oh boy, sorry.
We all have a self-serving bias. This is, this is exactly, thinking exactly correctly. Our self-serving bias is that we assume that our perspective is correct. We assume that our perspective is correct. When someone else is doing something, you assume it is Well, they're doing it because they're a bad person. Or they're doing something good because they're a good person. We assume that these attributions are because of themselves. But for ourselves, what do, why do we do stupid things? Yeah, for, situationally. So John, basically, when he was trying to defend himself, he was trying to say, oh, no, 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 I'm not racist. Because does he feel like he's racist? No, if you ask most people, they say, no, I'm not racist. A few people are like, hell yeah, I'm racist. There's a guy we saw at Costco with the little Hitler tattoo on his elbow and a big swastika tattoo on his, on his arm. And he is openly, happily racist. I actually prefer those people as opposed to the person with the giant swastika under their shirt. Because at least you know what you expect. Okay? But at the same time, is that people have this self-serving bias. He doesn't believe that he's racist. He keeps coming up with reasons for why he said that. But every time he comes up with a reason for why he said that, he realizes that, or he's not realizing it, we realize that his disposition, he is stereotyping and using these generalizations. But as a car salesman, we had to deal with a lot of used car salesmen Sunday. Four, technically. Went to four different places before we found the car we wanted. And um, one of them even called me during class yesterday to make sure we were okay. Why would they call back? If we were undecided and one person calls back, are we likely to think that they really care about us? Yes. And if you ever watch the, the, the way that people sell cars, is that they listen. If they do it right, they listen to these things. But you can also see people that are what we call the stereotype. The fundamental attributionaries, they assume that things are based on your disposition. When they, they talk to me, they talk about the power and the handling of the car. They talk to my wife, they talk about all the fluffy features of the car. And that's what the what John... <laughs> So uh, the second part of the test drive was pretty funny. So my wife chimes in, because she's smarter than I am, and she goes, so uh, how was the rest of the test drive with her? She goes, I don't remember. Anyway, he remembers this incident because it fit his idea. What happened to the rest of it? Probably like any other test drive. So like we drive out to the end by Gillespie Field, and my, I get in the car to drive, and he's like, he goes, so this car's got X amount of horsepower, and it's super fast. And I'm like, eh, I don't care. It's going to be my wife's car. And he goes, no, no, really step on it. So I look at him, and I put my finger on the traction control button. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,005. Well, sport mode comes up on the Lexus thing, and then the traction control turns off. I go, you ever go drifting? My wife goes, don't you dare. <laughs> put it back in eco mode. Will Alexis IS 250 drift? Yes, it will. <laughs> Extremely nicely, just in case. Don't do it because it's dangerous. Moving on. Because, but if you want to be stupid, it's okay because you're stupid. Just don't blame the situation. Okay. Then you don't make a self-serving bias. You don't make an attribution error. You accept the fact that you're being stupid and smile and go for it. So the last part of this is how do you, where do you learn these attributions from? That's what No, we can't use the word society because society is too vague. So we, lo we learn them from observations. If John had said this, oh, I see the Asian driver had a really hard time with this. If he had said that, and my wife and I had not talked back to him about it, what would my son have learned from the situation? 
Asian women are bad drivers. Now, and it's not that he ever saw an Asian woman being a bad driver. It's not that he ever, um, it, it wasn't, we don't have this conversation at home, well, those Asian women can't drive. My friend Henry is a little bit on the racist side. He calls them P1s. Does anybody know CHP language for what a P1 is? The person who caused the accident. <laughs> so when you see that guy street racing, you call them a P1 because they're the ones that caused the accident. They're not necessarily the ones in the accident, but they're the ones that caused the accident. So he calls anybody who's slow and old and female and generally overweight driving as a P1 because he assumes they can't drive. I'm overweight. I can drive. Not important. Okay, but the object, so if you make observations in your environment, if you make observations in your environment, your culture shapes your environment. And so, um, this is just a little bit of stats fun. What if you have a very large N? What happens to your distribution? Peyton? <laughs> A large N means narrow. Oh, I was trying to turn those into triangles yesterday, too. Okay, so if you have a very large number of n, n means number of observations, sample, okay? You narrow your generalization. Um, Aiden, my, my son's friend, does not like, he likes cars, but he doesn't know much about cars. My son spends a lot of time looking at cars. Uh, for Christmas, they bought him the Forza car game that has the ultimate pack associated with it. That's what he really wanted for Christmas. So he can get any car in the Forza game, which is, there's thousands of cars in this stupid game. He keeps getting new ones all the time. And what's great about it is when he gets a car, he studies it. He looks at the horsepower. He looks at all, these, all the elements of it. He really wants to be an engineer. He's kind of shifting toward automotive engineering because he really likes cars and he likes the way they work. He's, I'm trying to teach him how to work on, you know, like on the changing the air filter and doing, changing the battery and doing stupid things that you can do on modern cars because you really can't work on modern cars. Anyway, but... <clears throat> so he doesn't generalize cars. He doesn't just say, it was a red car. But, I mean, he can, he can identify pretty quickly. We have a game where you try to identify a car by its headlights on the freeway. So, like, when we're driving... What you do when you're bored driving to Adelanto. Um, but you, or you, you identify the car based on its taillights. And he's pretty good about this because what does he spend a lot of time doing? Looking at cars. Because he spends a lot of time looking at cars, he can identify them very quickly. He doesn't generalize. It was a Toyota Camry. That's actually one of the reasons we didn't buy a Lexus is because my wife goes, ooh, I really like that color, Lexus. That's a Camry. Ooh. <laughs> she goes, no Lexus. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a Camry. Actually, the new Camrys look pretty cool. I said, hey, that new Camry looks cool. My son goes, you're old. <laughs> okay, so but what if you only have one observation? If all that you've ever seen are Toyota Camrys, what is every car to you? It's a car. You don't notice the differences between different cars. We were at... Um, I dropped my wife and her friends off at some fancy restaurant in La Jolla, and there's a freaking McLaren in the parking lot. Road cone orange McLaren. And I'm like, that's awesome. There's some guy that I've one around here I've seen a couple times. And so and having a road cone orange McLaren is even cooler, because you get a car that says, look at me, and then you say, look at me. <laughs> he gets out and just crawl. Anyway, moving on. So, but, but the fun the thing is, is that I... After, I, on the way home, I called my son. I'm like, hey, there's an orange McLaren. I took a picture of it. There's an orange McLaren in the parking lot. Totally cool. And I asked my wife, did you see the, the McLaren? Said, what? The orange car. 
I think there was an orange car parked there. How come she didn't notice the orange McLaren? Doesn't care. Does not care at all. There's a $300,000 car sitting in the parking lot. They can go 213 miles an hour. <laughs> so. Because you need that. It's important to have. For grocery, you can't put grocery in there. There's no room. Yeah, so you just... That's this thing. Yeah. You have to take out the tire. And then maybe get half a tank of gas. Then, the, then you can't go to the speed bump getting in the parking lot anyway. So, moving on. I want one. That's all I can say. So, but again, so this, what happens is, and this is actually where we're getting back to it, does this sound familiar? Have we talked about the same concept before? This is how it works with everything in psychology. We, we make attributions. We judge people. You judge people. Why do you judge people? It's easy to. It's not necessarily conditioning because it's not necessary. We'll talk about some conditioning of judging where it does produce classical conditioning like fear. But it's easy. We automatically judge people. And this is why this is so, this is so important. Over this next couple, next two or three weeks in this class, you well, wait a second. Do you judge yourself as well? Yeah. So we'll talk about something called depression a little bit later in the semester. You guess what depression is? It's, it's where you can't wrap your head around yourself. And then you start making dispositional attributions about yourself. You start making dispositional attributions about yourself. Why can't I do this? I should be able to handle this, but I can't. What's wrong with me? And as soon as you start going on that path, the number of observations change. As opposed to the positive observations about yourself, you start making negative observations about yourself. So just talking about something as, as serious as depression, you can start to see where this, this judgment that we have, this attribution theory is really important in trying to understand the bigger pictures of sight. So we're going to do a couple exercises and activities in the next week or so that are going to cause you to feel uncomfortable. Why do I have to make you feel uncomfortable? No, it's not fun. I hate it. I don't like making people feel uncomfortable. I want people to be happy. I do not target introverts. I respect the introverts. I tease them because I'm an extrovert, but I respect them and leave them no space. That's why I don't force people to answer questions in class. Uh, one of my friends, professors, has this index card deck and he pulls out a card and makes people answer questions. Ha! <laughs> it is. Just yell elephant. No elephant! The extroverts think that's funny. The introvert goes, why? That's stupid. Okay, so. So now. So, getting back to the, getting back to the idea of what we're going to be doing is that how do you get to how do you have how do you get to make observations? How do we increase your N? How do we increase your N? How do I make you make more observations? What's really interesting in the study of this thing we could, we're, actually we're sneaking into called social psychology. I always make the joke is I hate social psych because it's too fluffy. It's very fluffy. There's not much science in social psychology. But do you think it's how you interact with the world around you? Yes. If you have a lot of fears, what happens with your interaction with the world around you? It's limited and you have smaller end. If you surround yourself with people like you, what happens to your number of observations? If you surround people, surround yourself with people who are just like you, you will be the same as you were before. And this is, you see this happening. 
because if you see if you see groups of people, there's a really good um, a really good thing on uh, NPR yesterday morning about this. It's it's called love your enemies. You have to love your enemies. Okay, which means that if you just fight with your enemies, what do you do with the amount that you understand them? If you fight with your enemies, if Trump says something annoying and I go, ah, rah, 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 and I get pissed off, am I actually going to understand why he's saying what he's saying? No, because it, it's easier to just go right to the fundamental attribution error and say, oh, it's dispositional. That person's a bad person because they said a bad thing. Is that true? No, it's not. They said a bad thing over and over and over. Not close. Okay. But what's funny is that when you actually start looking at the um, when President Obama was elected, let me see if I can find this clip real quick. Is this it? 